Welcome. Our conversation on one-on-one -on -one today is with Dr. Charles Somoli, a trainer and strategist to businesses and governments across Europe, Middle East and Africa. He is also a lawyer, a constitutional law scholar, as well as a security consultant. This Nigerian is also a global expert in law enforcement jurisprudence in matters relating to good governance in national security operations, security sector reform, excellence in policing and leadership development, as well as organizational transformation. Alongside his many global scholarship interests, Dr. Mole also sits as a judge in the London Circuit of the British Judiciary in both the Crown and Family Courts. He joins us for a conversation on the program today. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. As a, a leadership consultant, I'll start with the situation in Nigeria. Do you agree with pundits that there is a leadership crisis in this country and how do we begin to address it? Well, that's a very excellent question. It's, yeah, it is true there is a leadership crisis, but it's not just a Nigerian problem. It's an African problem. Uh, the trajectory of all African countries have largely been the same, which is downwards, so, you know, in the last 30, 40 years. Uh, the only time, really, if you look back, that African countries have done anything if I want to use the word positive in a look way, in, in, in a sort of loose way, it has been when they were under colonialism. After colonialism, it seems the countries just went bad, so to speak. And the reason is because of two things, I would say. Number one, we, we've had leaders in Nigeria and Africa who seem to have been over-promoted beyond their competency. So we have people who've led us who are not supposed to lead people, number one. The second thing I also see is that um, leadership is uh, exemplified by your ability to look at the small things. Uh, we have leaders that are not good at nuances. You know, anybody can see the headlines, anybody can see the big picture. It's your ability to see the small things that distinguishes you as a leader. So we've had leaders, therefore, that uh, don't seem to have that ability, technical ability, to lead. Because um, you know you could, you know uh, uh, you could be a good person and be a bad leader. Uh, it's about capacity. It's about being able to look at those little little things. And until we accept that that is an African problem, we will not begin to you know uh, address it the way we should. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Leadership is not even. I, I would. I, I don't know a lot about it, but I do believe that it's not just an African thing. Even it's a global phenomenon. We have yeah. leaders who need who have areas that they need to improve on, but. When we look at it from the Nigerian perspective, where are the giants of Africa? If we can get it right, we might begin to set setting precedents for other smaller nations mm, in the mm. uh, continent to pick up from. So I want to ask you, mm. how, in your opinion, aside from recognizing that we do have a problem, how do we begin to change the narrative when it comes to leadership in this country? Well, I mean, the... You mentioned it's a global problem. That is true, but the difference I think you will see globally, uh, in order in the, say in the Western Western nation, is there is a system that creates a pipeline of leaders. For example, in the U.S., you serve in the military, and then you are retired. You join politics, or you start as a community organizer. You start, then you go to state legislature. You end up becoming either a governor or to the you know national you know equivalent of national assembly. The point here, Nigeria is the only place where you can be a shop worker yesterday and tomorrow you're a governor. Yeah, okay. you know, so, so that is a problem we have. So because there's no pipeline, the good, what that pipeline does, it, it refines you. It uh, uh, more or less enables you to cut your teeth in leadership on a lower level. So that as you gain more experience, you go higher. But in Nigeria, anyone can come and say, you know, that's why if you look at, look at the presidential elections, for example, look at the candidates. These are people who have not managed two people in their lives, some of them, and they want to be president of a 200 million, you know, I mean, for them to even have the audacity that, they, you know, because the constitution says you have the right to, doesn't mean you should. You know, you know so, so, so the challenge we have is that pipeline is not there. As a result, there is no way of creating the competency needed there's no leadership uh, academy. There's no leadership uh, either in terms of theoretical or practical way of actually creating. Even if you go to the, to the United Kingdom, for example, 
You know, uh, you know, you have a situation where people will leave Oxford and Cambridge and say the, what they want to do, they want to go into the civil service. So they go, you know, become you know, secretaries to MPs, and before you know it, they become politicians. But in Nigeria, it's not the same. Our bright and brightest, you know, don't consider that as you know, a, a career option. So the first thing I think really will be to begin to encourage the right kind of people to in, be involved in leadership. Because everything falls on leadership in this country. Sure. How, how do we get them to begin to? I, I know I'm putting on a lot about this mm. uh, leadership issue because I believe that from there we can move forward. So these young, we do have leaders in this country. How do we get them involved? How do we encourage that commitment to patriotic uh, traits? Well, I don't think patriotism is really the problem. I mean, the challenge we have in Nigeria at the moment in terms of leadership is will Turkeys ever vote for Christmas? That, you know, that is the issue. You know, the people that the dysfunction benefit will want to perpetuate the dysfunction. So it's not in their interest to, uh, uh, you know, uh, as it were, uh, you know, uh, want to reform because that's more or less doing themselves out of a job. But you see the opposite happening in many countries. For example, in the United Kingdom, many years back, the Prime Minister then, David Cameron, said, we have too many MPs. We need to reduce the numbers by 50. And the MPs voted in favor of that. You know, so it's almost like voting to sack 50 of, the, of their colleagues. You know? But in Nigeria, you never see anything like that. Anything that will impact them in, in, in the establishment negatively, they wouldn't do it. So that is a challenge. So what that simply means is a, uh, uh, to get into the reins of leadership, it won't be given to us. We've got to go and get it. And that is, that, it has to be bottom up. And that is the mo a kind of loose movement need to you know, be started in this country where we know they won't give it to us, but we've got to engage to go and get it. Yeah, how would you rate uh, performance at the newcomers in the just concluded elections before we go forward? Well, I feel the, in, in terms of the just concluded elections, I think there's something called political intelligence. Uh, is different from emotional intelligence. I think a lot of our young people don't have that political intelligence. Um, everybody, for example, focused on being the president. But in a democratic system, the most powerful body is the legislature. And most people don't, they underrate that. It's only the legislature that can fire the president. The legislature can pass any law they like. If the president vetoes it, they can override the veto. So the legislature is incredibly, incredibly powerful, but we are abandoning that to all sorts of people, and everybody wants to become the president. You know, and that for me is a tactical error. And the other tactical error is that the, I'm using the word loosely now, the third force, as they are called. Yes, I was actually going to bring that if you did it, because that's like the young people group. Mm. A lot of persons had hope and, you know, looked forward to something coming out from that arrangement. Uh, uh, but, but the problem with that is the, the, there's no unity. I mean, uh, again, if you, again, I like giving African context to all this, is because I work, I've done work in practically all the African countries. Um, it's the same pattern. You cannot dislodge a monopoly of certain leaders if the opposition is fragmented. You know, take Zimbabwe is another example. You know, when the, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the current president, you know, the, you know, uh, uh, you know, did election, you know, it was last year, the year before. Uh, there were twenty, just about twenty, opposition presidential candidates. So the question you ask yourself is, you want to remove Zanu PF, who's been there for? Youngs, and then there are twenty of you. <laughs> you know, who, how do uh, you do that? How, of course, it was bound to me. The election was predictable, because anyone who who doesn't uh, who didn't want rather the uh, the establishment now have twenty candidates to vote for. So you diffused the opposition, and that's exactly what happened in Nigeria as well. You know, uh, having 40, 50, whatever number of presidential candidates is silly. You know, so until there is a form of coalition. I don't think the, you know, the CME students or PDP, APC will be dislodged. I mean, they might change their names, but they're more or less still the same thing.
All right, let's move a little bit away <laughs> from that and look at another pressing issue in this country, and that's the conversation about security. Now, yes. the latest um, uh, conversation is about regional um, security outfits. What's your take? Are we solving a problem with another, or is this self-help effort something to be embraced? Mm, well, it's, I'm a little bit mixed in terms of my reaction because I'm looking at my technical understanding based on research uh, of the potential for sec uh, regional security outfit or even state, se state security outfit. Actually, we cannot have regional security outfit uh, under the current setup because only states can have. Even the Amoteco now, you know, is now state-based. It's no longer regional because regional doesn't exist in that sense because there's no regional house of assembly to pass a law that's regional. So it has to be each state that State passes it, there. and then they say they will cooperate, cooperate. You know, with one another. But the key point really about this is we need to be student of history. Um, in the, up until 1968, you know, we had the local native police forces in Nigeria and the regional police forces. Uh, the, they were eventually merged in 1968. When Yeronzi became the president, uh, the head of state, you know, there are all kinds of complaints about the local police forces, as they were native police forces, as they were called then. Uh, the the Obas, the Emirs, the local politicians were using them against the opposition. They were using them as tools. They were corrupt. All the every, everything we we have against the Nigerian police now was we had then. We had then. So uh, Irunzi put together an expert panel to say, okay, advise me what to do. And the expert panel said, you know what? Get rid of regions, all the local police forces. Let's have only one police in Nigeria. That's how we got to where we are. So in 1968, the local and native police forces were merged with the Nigerian police force. So those talking about regional state policing, don't understand, we've been there before. They had problems. So simply saying we want state police now without structural you know, adjustment in a, in a way, uh, it, it is a problem. The problem we have in Nigeria with, with the with security in Nigeria generally are two, about two or three things. Number one, we have too many outfits. We have 21 MDAs that are security related in the country. That's the largest in Africa. Oh. You know, one of the early, one, one of the lessons of 9-11 in the United States was the fact that, uh, and this is United States that have, as a last count, they have just over 18,000 police forces in the U.S. You know, every estate can have their police, campus can have their police, you know, you know police that, 18,000 of them. And what 9-11 showed them is that they had pockets of information. Left doesn't talk to the right hand. All the, they find that all the hijackers, all the terrorists, were all in the system. But CIA, we have some information. FBI, we have some information. NSC, we have some information. But nobody was talking to one another. So that was what led to the creation of the Homeland Security, you know, Security Department, which is now saying all the police forces in the U.S., all the intelligence agencies, all your information, we are sitting over it. So we can gather information across the board, unifying information. That's where intelligence comes from. Now, what we've done in Nigeria is, rather than unifying our security uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, in infrastructure, we've created silos. You know, and the important thing is those silos are not cooperating, they're competing with one another. For superiority. For superiority and for resources. Example, all the private security firms in Nigeria, that you know many of them, they are licensed by the National security, uh, Civil Defense Corps, not the Nigerian police. It's the civil defense that licenses all of them. So in terms of, and they pay millions every year to maintain the license. But the police right now has no way of saying, okay, they are security, let's see what they're, they have. No, they have to go to civil defense for permission. And civil defense can say, you know what, that's our own little nest egg. You are not having, you are not having access to it. So that's just, everybody is competing with one another. You know, and as a result of that, you know, uh, you see SSS, we have information, uh, intelligence, they won't pass it to the police, so we don't trust them, they will leak it. So, so everybody's just building their own empire. And that is a recipe for security failure. So what, what is your, what would be your strategy to harmonize, because security is like the most, the most important thing right now mm. before every other, because if we don't have that, the economy and every other aspect might be affected. So what would be your strategy to help address this? 
The number one problem and failure we have in Nigeria is intelligence. And um, even though we have the SSS, you know, they do have certain capabilities uh, in terms of intelligence gathering, but they, at least they don't share it readily. That's number one. But more importantly, the police are terrible at gathering intelligence because the systems have not been put in place. We don't have what I call intelligence-led policing. What we have instead is police-led intelligence. You know, in other words, you will have been arrested first by the police. Before investigation. Before, 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 the, before, the, before they find out. You know, I mean, when last you do hear, oh, this ham robbery gang was broken up because police infiltrated them. <laughs> you don't hear, you hardly hear that. Yeah. It's only after ham robbery has been committed, then police will show up. You know, so in lack of intelligence gathering capability is a recent fundamental problem. And for me, that is a core of the failure of security in Nigeria. I mean, if you are in Ikeja, we're in Lagos here. Yeah? If you're in Ikeja, you go and report something in the police station in Ikeja. And you get to VI a, a week later, and you went to report something similar. I said, but I reported it in Ikeja last, last week. The, the only way they will know is Ikeja police have to pick up your phone. Call the police station in Ikeja. Tell them the day you reported it. They have this paper, ledger. Somebody has to go to that paper and read and see that, oh, you reported it. I mean, who does that in this day and age? Systems have systems. to be There is no changed. joined up systems. I mean, uh, last year, November, I visited the fingerprint uh, police, central fingerprint, uh, this is here in Lagos. They, st all, they still have, um, what's it called? I didn't see a single computer. And what did they have? They have filing cabinets. So I now ask them, how do you do fingerprint assessment? They brought out the magnifying glass. The old fashioned way that you used to see in, you know, in, the, in the old uh, detective world. So they bring fingerprint, uh, I mean, magnifying glass, and that's how they scan it. No this, system. This whole thing still goes back to the leadership problem, because if the right leadership is there, providing direction, mm. some of these things could be addressed. So let, let's still on that um, uh, part of the conversation. Uh, we we're talking about the service chiefs at mm -hmm. the moment. They're asking that they, you know, step aside. A lot of persons are saying they've served. Mm. Maybe something is not. Is that part of uh, some of the challenge we have? What's your uh, stance in the conversation? I believe it is true the service chiefs needs to go. I've said that on my Twitter feed many times. The current chief of army staff should have resigned, should have retired in 2016. But is that the solution? Yeah, Them see, leaving? No, no, you see, the thing is, you have to understand something. The military is pure, is largely command and control. You know, okay, we've heard the stories, I mean, I don't want to give out too much, you know, national security information here, but we have the stories of things that like happen in Chibok and all these places in Borno. One hour before the Boko Haram people show up, a phone call will come telling the military contingent there to leave. So they leave, and then one hour later, mayhem. Mayhem. Who told them to leave? That officer cannot say no to that order on the phone to leave. So in a place like in, in, in an institution like military leadership matter. It doesn't matter what the rank and file think. They obey orders. So the body language of their leaders matter a lot. A lot of, even, even giving Mr. President, even want to give Mr. President some benefit of a doubt, in some of the things that happen are not things he, he, President, but I won't pick up the phone and say, hey, go and do X. People read his body language and say, okay, if we do this, it will please him. So they take it upon themselves to do certain things. Now, who sets that body language is the president, is the leader. So in the military here, it matters who the, chief, who, who the chiefs are because the tone they set matters a lot. The strategy they implement matters a lot. You know, so, so it's, it's a, it's a, uh, for me, I also feel that um, if they've served five years or more, all of them without exception are way beyond their retirement age, what is the case for keeping them? Is a question. You know, they've done their bit. Let somebody else bring fresh eyes to the problem. Do we have those people? Yes, we do. If nothing else, a new person will want to impress. So, Fair enough. So a new person will want to, you know, say, okay, a new sheriff is in town. So he probably will be a bit bolder and be more ambitious in certain things than others. Now, I'm not saying that's a magic wand that solves the problem. Uh, but um, you know, when you have ten, when you have hundred problems, 
solving one, you know, it, means it, you have 99 left. So, yeah. so I'm not saying sacking them solves the problem, but even sacking them is not the right word. They are all beyond their retirement age, uh, retirement uh, service time. So that's so it's not in quote sacking them in that for sense. For them to go rest after e serving a exactly. while. Exactly. You've done well. Go, you know, go and let somebody else take the reins. Yeah, there's so much to talk to you about. I don't even know how, <laughs> which one to prioritize before the other. But uh, before we go on this yeah. break, let me quickly chip in the conversation about the economy mm. in this very insecure time. What's your take on the effect of this continuous, not only insurgency, banditry, tuggery, and the political you know, shenanigans that's going on? How is it affecting our economy? Well, I mean, I, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I write a column for a particular financial magazine in Nigeria, and my contribution for uh, February's edition is actually titled, uh, you know, uh, the, the the implications of economic implications of, of insecurity. Oh, okay. Yeah. I have not read it, but <laughs> it seems very you know, apt. So, so, yeah. yeah. So because I because when we're talking about security, and I and I said that I said there is no single prosperous, insecure nation on the, place of, on, the, on the face of the earth. Security affects everything. Name one country that you say is prosperous economically and is insecure. You can't name one on planet. So security is key. It affects everything. And that is what we do not understand. It's one of the, you know, uh, uh, all attempts. And I showed, for example, take foreign direct investment. From, you know, it was rising. Between the last four years, it's been on downward spiral. Yeah, there must be some targeted uh, uh, investment in in our petroleum sector. But if you take that out, it's actually going down. So and going down drastically because nobody wants to invest in a nation that they are not sure. And you know, and uh, you know, so so insecurity is a major problem in terms of uh, investors' confidence. You know, in terms of uh, if you want to, if you want to take. Um, the wider economic policy of government. I, you don't, don't get me started on that. Uh, there was an article two months earlier that I wrote on, the, for example, the cashless policy of the CBN, how it's counterproductive. You know, how CBN is now seen is more as a sort of almost like a revenue generating agency for the government, rather than really managing the economy the way it should. You know, and how cashless policy is actually, you know, uh, increasing cash rather than reducing it. In terms of the use of cash, I mean. So, 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 what I think uh, is missing is I, I did tell. I mean, uh, uh, there was a blog I wrote within the first two weeks of President Buhari becoming president in 2015, and in that I said the only way you, sh you, sh you can win, you can govern properly here is create a central policy unit in the presidency, determine the, pres the policy of your government. So you are now giving each ministry a decided policy to implement. Right now, they are, they are, it's free for, they are just doing their own thing. You know, and that is a problem. There is no vision, no central vision to the whole thing. So, you know, uh, uh, um, so I feel it's a trial and error you know, uh, to reform this country, to uh, uh, change the economy. And, uh, uh, you know, it's not difficult. And I must say, tell you this. Corruption is not our biggest problem. Okay, we'll come back and we'll talk about some of those <laughs> strategies and maybe, you know, chipping things about restructuring. And you get to tell us about some of your publications no and the ones that are coming. <laughs> all right, we'll go on a very short break and we'll come back. All of that and more. Stay with us.